story of how God was seeking a bride for his son. Each book is different from every other book. I'm trying to give you the keys for you to unlock it for yourself. Now we're going to look at two more minor prophets, so-called, because they're short and brief, but they're not minor in God's sight, they're major characters. And we look at the ninth out of the twelve minor prophets in the Bible now, Zephaniah. We know very little about him, he's not mentioned elsewhere, and the focus is on the message rather than the messenger when we get to the prophets. The only biographical details are in chapter 1, verse 1, where we are told his name, and his genealogy. The name Zephaniah, really in Hebrew it's Sephan Yah, Sephan Yah, which means hidden God. Now we don't mean, know whether that means that God had hidden himself, he certainly hadn't spoken for about 70 years. Uh, or it could mean that Sephan Yah himself, or Zephaniah, had been hidden by God. I think that's the more likely uh, explanation of his name, and I, I'll explain why in a moment. But his genealogy is interesting. He's the only prophet who traces his ancestry back four generations. The son of, the grandson of, the great-grandson of, and then the great-great-grandson of. And once you get back to that fourth generation, he is related to Hezekiah. He is therefore royal blood. He's a descendant of King Hezekiah, who was the last good king of the two tribes in the south. By now the ten tribes in the north have gone. They've been taken away to Assyria. And the two tribes in the south are in danger of following them if they don't learn the lesson from what happened to the other ten tribes. And Hezekiah was the last good king. He was a man after God's own heart. He did what was right in the sight of the Lord, and he feared God and was humble before God. Now all that makes a good king. So what's been happening since Hezekiah? The answer is some very bad kings. And the man who followed Hezekiah couldn't have been a greater contrast. He was a very bad king. His name was Manasseh. And uh, it's really almost too horrible to read. He rebuilt all the pagan altars on the high ground. He re-erected those dreadful phallic symbols and the Asherah poles. And he encouraged the people to go back to the fertility cults with, of course, their sexual overtones. He introduced the worship of Moloch and introduced child sacrifice and killed his own sons to this god. And he offered these boys to the god Moloch in a valley called Hinnom, or Gehenna, a valley just south of Jerusalem. And uh, Jeremiah cursed that valley. And Jesus later used it as a picture of hell. It became the rubbish dump and the sewage dump did the valley of Gehenna after that. And uh, all through the early years of uh, Manasseh's reign, there was a prophet called Isaiah who tried to stop it. And do you know what uh, Manasseh did first? He forbade Isaiah to, to preach. So Isaiah wrote his prophecies down, and they were circulated in written form. That's how we got the book of the prophet Isaiah. And Manasseh, when he heard this, was so furious, he ordered Isaiah to be bound and pushed inside the trunk of a hollow tree, and then he ordered people to saw the trunk of the tree in half. And that's how Isaiah met his death. He was literally sawn in half. He's mentioned in Hebrews chapter 11, where there is a phrase, some were sawn asunder. And that's a direct reference to how Isaiah met his end under this very bad king. Well, he got involved in astrology. He got involved with spiritist mediums. And this spiritual confusion, of course, led to moral chaos. Idolatry always leads to immorality until God actually says of Manasseh in the book of Chronicles, he was more evil than the original Canaanites. Now can you imagine how God feels? Because God got rid of those evil Canaanites 
to make room for his holy people. And now they are worse than the people they replaced. Well, that was a very dangerous situation. Well, Manasseh died after reigning for 55 years, and he was succeeded by a man called Ammon, a very weak character who did nothing to put the situation right, and Judah simply became more evil. And there was great intrigue and treachery, and finally Ammon was assassinated after only two years on the throne. The whole nation is in moral chaos now. And when Ammon was assassinated, it meant that a young boy became king, only eight years old, and his name was Josiah. And the question was, how would Josiah shape up? Now, because he was so young, the real ruler in the early years was Hilkiah, the high priest. But as Josiah the boy developed, the big question was, would he go the way of Hezekiah, his grandfather, great-grandfather rather, or would he go the way of Manasseh, his grandfather? Which way would this boy go? And that's when God sent Zephaniah the prophet. And really, Zephaniah's task was to try under this boy king's reign to pull the nation back before it became too late and they were taken off as the ten tribes had also been taken off already. So that puts the setting, doesn't it? And I believe that <coughs> Zephaniah, as a boy, had been hidden, just like Moses was hidden, just like others had been hidden. Uh, and that's why his mother gave him the name, Hidden by God, Zephan Yah. That's my theory anyway, uh, because the little boys were all being sacrificed to Moloch. And his mother saved him. He was a royal prince and the other royal princes were being sacrificed. So I think his mother hid him and brought him up. And that's why she gave him that name. Well, the voice of prophecy had been silent for 70 years, ever since um, Hezekiah died and Isaiah had been sawn asunder. No word from God. But now at last Zephaniah comes with a very strong message. And his whole message revolves around the day of the Lord. I've explained to you already that that's not a 24-hour period. It means the day of God's judgment, the day of, of putting things right, the day of vindication of righteousness, the day when wrongs are righted, when wickedness is punished. The day is coming. And you might say that the whole uh, of Zephaniah revolves around this day of the Lord when God's going to settle accounts with people. And as the day gets nearer, as it must be doing, then God's people must be getting ready for it or should be. Uh, I'm sure you know that there are four quarter days in the English calendar for settling accounts. There's Lady Day, March the 25th, Midsummer Day, June the 24th, Michaelmas Day, September the 29th, and Christmas Day, December 25th. These were the four quarter days for settling accounts. And all debts had to be paid on those quarter days. And all finance brought up to date. And that's when fraud was revealed and punished. It was the audit day. And uh, all those four days give us a kind of little picture of the day of the Lord when all accounts are examined and audited and settled and fraud is punished. So the day of the Lord is coming. <coughs> now I'm no singer, but I keep bursting into song. Max, could you get to the piano, please? And I'm going to sing you three songs while I study Zephaniah because I told you there's a, a direct connection between uh, prophecy and music. And there's a lot about singing in the prophets. And I'm sure this is the chorus that Zephaniah would want us to learn. Just give me the first note of the first one. Yeah. That is the day. That is the day when the Lord will judge, when the Lord will judge. We will regret, we will regret, and be sad in it, and be sad in it. That is the day when the Lord will judge, we will regret and be sad in it. That is the day, that is the day when the Lord will judge. Now, that's, I think, what Zephaniah would have wanted to sing. Not a cheerful one, but a day of judgment, a day to be sad, a day to repent, a day for tears, not joy. Well, now let's look at the outline of Zephaniah and uh, break it up a bit. 
Uh, I break it up into three sections which are very clear, but once again I'm afraid the chapter headings are in the wrong place. So often the chapter divisions spoil the Word of God because they separate what God has joined together and put asunder, and it's a pity. But there it is. In the first section, he is concerned with the foreign religions which have got into Judah. And he announces judgment and he makes four basic statements about the judgment of the day of the Lord that's coming. That judgment is deserved. It is now declared. He then describes what it will involve and what will happen to them when God judges. And then he offers them the possibility that even at this stage, judgment can be deflected from Israel and turned away by repentance. It's the same message all the prophets have. Uh, to us, when we read one prophet after another, we say, well, that's the same message as the one we've just looked at. Of course it was, because God repeats himself when it's necessary. But bear in mind that whereas these prophecies in the Bible come next to each other, there was often a gap of 70 years between them, and therefore they had to be said all over again. And so Zephaniah was saying, that is the day when the Lord will judge, and it's getting very, very near, and still you are going down the wrong path. And look what's happening in the nation, he said, and he, you could see it. They didn't need to be told what was happening. Well now, this is the shape of the prophecy. There is this um, first section on foreign religion. Then we turn to a second section in which he also spreads the net of judgment to other nations, to the nations all around. And he includes them and says the God of Israel will not only judge us, but he will judge you too. And uh, he boxes the compass. On the west side of Judah was the land of Philistia, Philistia or Philistines, from which incidentally the modern Pil Palestinian claims to be descended. And the word Palestinian is directly descended from the word Philistine. don't know if you knew that. <clears throat> then on the east side, Moab and Ammon. On the south side, Egypt and even as far south as Ethiopia. And on the north side, Assyria is still the world power, the biggest power on the Tigris and Euphrates rivers. Babylon hasn't come onto the scene yet. Assyria is the nation that has taken away the ten tribes in the north, so most of the people of God have gone now. And just little Judah is left, surrounded by these nations. But Zephaniah has the courage to say, these nations also will be judged by God. He is the judge of the whole world. And especially, you remember, they will be judged for their attitude to Israel, those that have had contact with her. An interesting point about the Philistines, when God brought the Israelis into Canaan from the east across the Jordan, at the same time, God brought the Philistines into the same land from the west across the Mediterranean. They were a people who lived in Crete, and God brought them to Canaan at the same time as he brought the Hebrew slaves. Now that's a bit of a mystery, isn't it? Amos chapter 9 mentions this. God says, did I not bring you from Egypt and did I not bring the Philistines from Crete? It's God who moves nations around. It's God who draws the map. Why then did he bring the Philistines to the same place at the same time when he was going to kick the Canaanites out? Because the Philistines became a real thorn in the side of uh, Israel right through to King David. King David really was the one who dealt them a death blow, though they still kept raiding even after that. It was always the Philistines. Samson had to deal with the Philistines, the Philistines, the Philistines. And in, indeed their word has actually become proverbial in the English language for someone destructive. He's a Philistine. We use their, their very name. Now why did God do that? Well, in Deuteronomy God explains. He said, I brought them to test you. If you keep my word, you will keep them at bay and there will be no problem to you. But if you disobey me 
I've brought them to be an instrument of discipline for you. And when you are doing wrong, they will overcome you. Now you see, God has his way of disciplining his people. God's a father to his people, and a good father disciplines his children when they go wrong. In fact, Hebrews 12 says, if the Lord doesn't discipline you, then you're not a true son of God, you're a bastard. Hebrews 12. One of the proofs that you're a child of God is that he does punish you. And as we shall see in a moment, the choice really is, do you want the punishment God, of God now or later? If you become a child of God now, then he will punish you now. Life won't be easy. When you go wrong, he'll, he'll deal with you. Whom the Lord loves, he chastises. But he does that so that you don't need to be punished afterwards. Do you see? So really, becoming God's people doesn't escape his punishment. It just brings it forward a bit. But it's much better to have it now and be a son of God and be chastised when we've been naughty so that we remain in the family than not have any punishment from God now and have it all later. See the choice. Now, many people don't realize that's the choice. Have it now or then. And I'd much rather have it now, would you not? And that's why Christians can expect life to be a bit tough here. Believe me, I, well, I, I can never believe those testimonies where people get up and say, I came to Jesus and all my troubles were over. <laughs> I used to believe them and it depressed me. Now I know it's not true. My testimony is a little different. I came to Jesus and my troubles began. Then I got baptized in the Spirit and my troubles got much worse. <laughs> and I've been in more trouble in the last five years than in the previous 40. That's my testimony. But I'm glad because it fits the promises of Jesus. He said, in the world you will have big trouble. But he said, cheer up, I'm on top of it. And I said to a friend of mine some time ago, how are you? And he said, I'm very well over the circumstances. <laughs> and I thought, that's a Christian talking. <laughs> Yes, Jesus promised us trouble in this life. There'll be trouble from the world who hates us, but there will also be trouble from God. God loves you too much to let you off. And if you steer away from his path, then expect trouble from him. That's his loving way of getting you back into his way and his line. And because he loves you now, he will do it now, much better than to store it all up for later, which is what the world is doing. So by and large, that means that God's people are going to have a rougher time than other people in this world. But in the next world, totally different. Now, I've really jumped right ahead. I didn't mean to say all that till I got to the end of this talk. But um, I'm a wee bit short of time, so I'm giving you the conclusion first. <laughs> all right. Let's move on then to the third section of Zephaniah. The first section, he really hits hard this indulgence in fertility cults and superstition and astrology and spiritist mediums and sacrificing babies to Moloch, he really goes hard after that. And he declares with great force, God is irritated by this. It's an interesting word. God is intensely irritated. And from that word actually came a song that was sung in many churches in the Middle Ages called Dies Irai, and irai is the Latin word from which we get irritate, or ire for anger, I-R-E. And it was a song that the church used to sing in the Middle Ages frequently, the day of God's irritation, the day when God has had enough, the day when God boils over. You see, there are two sorts of anger in the Bible. Uh, in the New Testament, there are two Greek words for anger. One is for that inner anger that you, that you keep inside, you don't let out, and it kind of simmers away inside, and people don't realize how angry you are. You know, a husband comes home late at night, and there's a note from his wife on the kitchen table. Your slippers are in the fridge, <laughs> and your supper's in the dog, and I've gone to bed with a headache, you know, the kind of thing. And he, he has no idea that she's been angry all day with him because she kept it in. That's one sort of anger. The other sort of anger is to boil over. Now, I'm not going to ask you which your problem is, but we'd probably find ourselves equally divided. 
but there's the simmering anger inside and the boiling over anger outside. Uh, which sort of anger is God's wrath? The answer is both. Have you ladies ever put a pan of milk on the stove and forgotten to watch it? If you watch it, you see it simmering and you're ready for it, but if you don't watch it and you go through and sit down, suddenly the house is filled with smoke <laughs> and you sniff and it's boiling over and you tear back to the kitchen and there it is burning on the hob. If you don't watch the simmering anger, you will not see when it boils over. And this is precisely what Zephaniah is saying and precisely what the Bible says. The Bible says God's anger is simmering now and I believe it's simmering over our country. And if you really keep your eyes open, you can see it because the signs of God's anger simmering are an increase in unnatural sexual relations, an increase in antisocial behaviour, an increase in breakdown of family life, an increase in people becoming slaves of their appetites and addiction. Now, all that's there and that's God's anger simmering. See, and Zephaniah is saying, look, can't you see that God's anger is simmering now and the day is coming when it boils over, when God can't hold it in any longer. And that's what is meant by the day of wrath in the New Testament as well as the Old. It's God is holding his anger in, but it's simmering and the symptoms of its simmering are there for all to see in a society going downhill. And it's there for all to see in our country right now and throughout the Western civilization, I believe. But one day it's going to boil over. And it's that day that we must deflect if we possibly can and put off by repenting and getting things put right. You see the, the picture? God's anger is like that pan of milk and it's simmering. But suddenly, quite quickly, the day of his wrath comes and his irritation boils over and he explodes. You see, when you're irritated by something or someone, it builds up, doesn't it? And it builds up until finally you let it out and it comes out very quickly when it comes out and uh, even unexpectedly if you haven't been aware that it was building up. Well, let's get back to this. So, in the last section, chapter 3, verse 1 to 20, chapter heading is in the right place there, there's a strange contradiction, there's a strange tension or ambiguity between cursing and blessing, between God's justice and his mercy. And it's almost as if Zephaniah is saying, choose, which are you really going to have? Which do you really want? God's justice to boil over in anger? This irritation, you are intensely irritating God right now and it's building up and it's got to explode at some point. And when it explodes, there will be nothing but justice and judgment. And yet, God is full of mercy and what he wants to do is to have mercy on you and show you his mercy. That's what he really wants. But he can't do that without your cooperation because mercy God only gives to those who ask for it. He loves to give mercy, but you know, people rarely ask for mercy. Have you noticed that? I listen to many, many prayers and I hear people praying for guidance, for help, for strength, for all kinds of things. But what thrilled me in the prayer this morning, you use the word mercy. God be merciful. You only use that prayer if you think you're pretty bad. If you think you're good, you ask for health, strength, guidance, all sorts of things, but you never ask for mercy. It's only bad people ask for mercy and we're all bad. And it's because of his mercy that we're not consumed and his mercies are fresh every morning. I always think of that if I bring the milk in in the morning. Sometimes when I get up in the morning, I feel like a Christian, so I make the cup of tea. <laughs> but it's not very often, is it? No. But when I do and I have to carry the milk bottles in from the front door, I always think of that verse in Lamentations, his mercies are fresh every morning. <laughs> but you only think of God's mercy if you feel bad enough not to deserve anything good. 
and nice, good church-going people don't often ask for mercy. They're not bad enough. But there's a great revival going on in the prisons of this country today because bad people are asking for mercy and they're getting it because God is merciful to those who want his mercy. And so we have a mixture here of, of justice and mercy and Zephaniah is saying, now which is it to be? In the first half of chapter 3, he really faces them with the possibility of a day of divine justice coming and he, he tells them how obstinate they are. They have rebelled against God quite deliberately and they are resisting God's appeal. He accuses them of rebellion and resistance. Uh, they are an obstinate people. I feel another song coming on. <laughs> but when I, when I read a little verse uh, in Zephaniah, it said, morning by morning he dispenses justice. And I found myself singing this to myself. Just give me a note. Great is thy righteousness, O God all holy. There is no error of judgment with thee. Thou changest not thy commandments, they fade not. As thou hast been, thou forever wilt be. Great is thy righteousness, great is thy righteousness. Morning by morning thy justice I see. All that sin merited thou hast requited. Great is thy righteousness, Lord, hear our plea. Now, I'll tell you why I've, I've done this. Because so often we love to sing the nice songs, the songs about God's faithfulness, the songs about this is the day we will rejoice and be glad. We like all that. But there's another side to God. And balancing God is very important. Paul says, behold then the goodness and the severity of God. Both goodness to those who believe, severity to those who do not. And goodness to those who go on believing is the right translation. And severity to those who do not go on believing. See, it's going on believing. It's not the faith you start with that saves. It's the faith you finish with. It's going on believing. John 3.16, properly translated, reads like this. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever goes on believing in him will never perish, but go on having eternal life. Has that changed that verse for you a little? It is the faith that goes on that saves. Well, he says, if you go on rebelling and resisting, there will be a national disaster. God's anger will boil over, the day will come. He also says that same anger will boil over towards the nations and obliterate those nations. But then, how often even the most uh, hard prophets, the most tough prophecies, end with a note of hope. As if God always wants to make a last appeal with good news. Amos was a very tough prophet. He was the second last prophet to the ten tribes in the north before they disappeared and his message is a tough message of God's justice. But the last word to the north was Hosea, a message of God's mercy and love. And it's almost as if God's last word to us is, won't you have my mercy? Interesting, isn't it? God longs. He doesn't want to punish. He has no pleasure in the death of the wicked. He wants to show mercy. And so, so many of these Old Testament prophets finished on a good note, a note of hope for the future, a note of mercy. And just as his note of justice here was both for the nation and the nations, his note of mercy is for the nations and then the nation. And his note of mercy for the nations was that out of every nation he's going to have people who love him. 
out of every kindred and tribe and tongue and people. God doesn't want a single ethnic group on earth to be missed out. That's why he told us to preach the gospel to all ethnic groups and make disciples of all ethnic groups. And that's important. The great move of God among the gypsies in this country at the moment, and these videos are being used to teach gypsy preachers who can't read or write and can't read the Bible. And just a few months ago, I was with 160 gypsy preachers, and they told me that there is not now a gypsy family in England without a Christian in it. And it may well be the first ethnic group in Britain to be entirely Christian. God wants every ethnic group in his family, and his mercy will ensure that there will be some out of every nation who are godly. That's a promise of God's mercy. Isn't that exciting? Heaven's going to be multiracial, but we're all going to be colorblind. Isn't that exciting? <laughs> But then he finishes up with the national gladness, with the possibilities of blessing for Israel itself. Nine times in this last little section, God says, I will, I will, I will, I will. They may break his covenant, but he will never break it. And he talks about a wonderful future when he will quiet them with his love. Isn't that a lovely phrase? He will quiet us with his love, calm us after all the stresses and strains of this world. I will quiet them with my love. And then it says, and God will sing. <laughs> that God will sing about his people. He will rejoice over them with singing. I feel a song coming on for all of us now. <laughs> Back to the piano, Max. Let's sing that chorus. Uh, how does it start? The Lord thy God in the midst of thee. It's not on the sheet. If you know it, join in with me. It's straight out of Zephaniah. I'm trying to communicate to you that prophecy and music go together. And when God, God wants to sing over us and sing with us. So let's sing that. All right. Don't stand, we'll just sing while we sit. Mm. The Lord thy God will rejoice over thee with singing. The Lord thy God in the midst of thee is righteous, is mighty. He thy God in the midst of thee is mighty, is mighty. with singing. The Lord thy God in the midst of thee is mighty, is mighty, is mighty. I made a mistake there, didn't I? I had the words in front of me and they were covered up. Sing it once more and I'll sing it out loud. All right. The Lord thy God in the midst of thee is mighty, is mighty. He will, God, in the midst of thee is mighty, is mighty. He will save, he will rejoice over thee, joy over thee with singing. The Lord thy God in the midst of thee is mighty, is mighty, is mighty. And the moral of this for me is don't try to sing on television. <laughs> Let's just round all this off. What Zephaniah is saying is, take your punishment now while God's anger is still simmering. Don't have it later when it boils over. And what he's saying is this, God's people have the opportunity to be judged now and to get right with God now. The nations will have to be judged later. And that's a principle that goes right through into the New Testament and Peter writes in his epistle, for it is time for judgment to begin with the family of God. And if it begins with us, what will be the outcome for those who do not obey the gospel of God? See? Have it now. And that leaves us with one question about Zephaniah. 
Did Josiah take any notice? Was his prophecy effective? Well, Josiah came to the throne at the age of eight in 640 BC and he reigned for 31 years. At first he was heavily influenced by the high priest Hilkiah and priests tend to keep the status quo. But then he began to be influenced by Zephaniah. At the age of 16, he destroyed the pagan altars around the country. At the age of 20, sorry, at the age of 16, he had destroyed the altars in Jerusalem. At the age of 20, he ordered all the pagan altars to be destroyed throughout the whole country. At the age of 28, he noticed that the temple of God was in bad repair and needed spring cleaning and needed repairing, so he ordered the temple of God to be put right. And while they did that, somebody found in a dusty old cupboard a copy of the Law of Moses. And they realized they hadn't been studying it or reading it for years. It's like finding a dusty old Bible on a, on a shelf. And they came to the king and said, look what we found in a cupboard. And he read it through. And he was horrified. He said, no wonder God is warning us. We've got to put this right. And at the age of 28, he ordered the law to be read again and done. This dear boy sought the Lord. But it was too late. You can't make people good by act of parliament. You can't impose righteousness from above. I know many people would like our government to pass laws making people behave in a Christian way. It doesn't work. It's got to come from the heart. And though Josiah did his best to clean up the country, he failed and then he made a big mistake. He decided to go to war against the Egyptians and God didn't tell him to. And he met the Egyptian army who weren't going to attack him. They were simply passing through the promised land to go and attack Assyria. And he should have just let them go through. But I'm afraid he said, you're not passing over my land. And he met the Egyptian army at Megiddo, at the crossroads of the world, and he died. He was killed in battle. It's a sad tale. There was a young man exactly the same age as Josiah, now 28, when Josiah died. And that young man was told, you've got to pick up this prophetic burden and you've got to tell it to the people because the reform of Josiah isn't working. You've got to tell it to the people. And that young man's name was Jeremiah. And that's how the prophecy of Jeremiah came to be. So Zephaniah failed. He tried hard and Josiah tried, but the people didn't listen. We're going to pick that up in the next prophet, Habakkuk because Habakkuk, 20 years later, just saw the situation getting worse and worse and worse. Now, before we leave Zephaniah, there's just one more thing I'd love to say. Uh, it's a remarkable correspondence between this Old Testament prophet and our New Testament. I think I can best show you on a chart. The outline of the prophet Zephaniah, the structure of his prophecy, is exactly the same as the outline of the book of Revelation. Both Zephaniah and Revelation, Revelation start with judgment on God's people. In this case Israel, in this case the church in chapters 1 to 3. They move on to judgments on the nations, 2, 4 to 15, and here chapter 4 to 19. They move on to the day of judgment, the day when the anger or irritation of God boils over, chapter 3, verse 1 to 8 in Zephaniah, chapter 20 in Revelation. But the last word is the final bliss of God's giving a place to his people where they can live forever. Chapter 3, 9 to 20, chapter 21 to 22. In Zephaniah it is, of course, the old Jerusalem, but in Revelation it's the new Jerusalem. In Zephaniah, God comes as king, but in Revelation, Jesus comes again as king. But isn't that remarkable? There are over 400 allusions to the Old Testament in the book of Revelation. 
But the closest connection is with the prophet Zephaniah, this little minor prophet, and maybe even John writing Revelation was influenced by the little minor prophet from centuries before as he wrote the revelation of Jesus Christ.